Welcome back to Good Games Pro Tour Fate Reforged PDQ in Melbourne 2014. I'm your host, Samuel Loy, and this is Jason Chung. Hey guys, I'm I'm Fazuna here from New Zealand and pretty much don't need to play this PDQ for the same reason as Sam. Yeah, we're both qualified already, so we're going to um, dive into a, a match right now and uh, see which one of these illustrious people is going to have a win in the next round. So we're in round seven right now. And I believe that our uh, feature match is Ian Wood of Adelaide and Australia versus Jan's Light from Canberra. And uh, I believe he lives in Melbourne now, but... So here we go. We've got Jan's Light on the left and Ian Wood on the right. So both just shuffling up and uh, getting ready to go. Both these players are X1 at the moment, so they've uh, won five and uh, lost one and need to win this to make the top eight. This should be their winning in round. This should be their winning in? Okay, so... Assuming they can ID the last round. Assuming that they can ID the last round, they're actually playing for top eight now. Uh, of course, that's not going to shake out until we see the standings, but um, playing for a lot here, really. So, so, so on the left, we have um, the black-green player. Both players are not playing any um, come and play tap lands, which kind of, kind of dictate um, more two-color, three-color decks. Yep. Um, yeah, we were lucky enough to see Jens last round, and... Uh, Again, he's got that Alpine Grizzly, which is really good in the last match on uh, on turn three, exactly when you want it. Um, Ian seems to be struggling for a second source of mana, but we can see he has a Bloodstained Mine in his hand. But that can't grab both his black and red source, so he has to decide which color he needs the most. So it's a, it's a big call here, right? Like uh, deciding, you know, it's possible that he just never draws that other color. So cracking this for one or the other means that he can play some of the cards in his hand and not others. And uh, we're just about to see which one he's going to go for here. We kind of see the downside of fetch lands here. If it was to come and play tap land, he'll have both his black and red, and he'll be able to play all his Mardu cards. Yeah. But, but here we see that he chose to pick a swamp over a mountain, and he's probably playing a morph. Yeah, I'd imagine so. He'll want something to block this Alpine Grizzly. Um, it's, you know, a pretty heavy clock taking four damage a turn, so doing something about it is pretty essential. And Mardu Horde Chief. Just as a 2-3, so not enabling the Raid Trigger. You'd normally see that guy come into play with another body, which is a 1-1 uh, Warrior token. Um, it's an interesting play, um, playing it without Raid. I wonder if his intentions is to block or to um, hold up maybe Feeder Resistance next turn. Uh, we can see here he just takes four. And he's probably setting up for defeat for next turn. All right. So another come, well, the first coming to play tap land for Yarns here. Uh, we'll see a follow up, which is probably just going to be another morph. Well, the first morph we've seen. F funnily enough, if Ian just played a um, morph, it would have got injured. Yeah. So the, you know the Mardu Horde Chief actually doing a little bit of work yep. here. Funnily enough, and attacking, which is uh, not what I expected, but <laughs> he might just have some raid triggers. Yeah. It would indicate that. So he's fourth mana and Head Hunter. Yeah, so Mardu Skull Hunter, which if you've raided on the turn it forces your opponent to discard a card. So given that Yarns is on the play here and managed to get, you know, a lot of his spells onto the board, he's actually got a fairly reduced choice of which cards he can discard there. He actually dropped an injury, which is like an interesting choice. His hand was forest. Uh, Mantis and Injury. So he wants to play the Hooting Mantis this turn, probably. Yeah, Hooting Mantis, uh, Del 4 4. Alright. So Ian's going to have to be pretty careful here not to take too much damage every turn. Um, right now he's, you know, taking 6 plus whatever this is. So Sagu Moa for a full yeah. 10 damage, and it's going to be very hard to beat. That is a really good morph. <laughs> it is a very good morph. <laughs> So 6-6, six, six, Trample, and Hexproof. I'd say that Ian, now on 5 life, is firmly on the defensive here and will have to do something pretty special. He's definitely on the bat foot here and struggling to find a third source of colour. Yeah, so he still hasn't found that red source and it comes back to that decision he made sure. earlier in the game with his Bloodstained Mire. We don't know if he's Mardu or Abstain yet, right? Uh, yeah, I, I, I don't think... I think he's got a, uh, a red card in hand, but yeah. um, it's possible that he's both. As well, like there's possible he's black, white, and splashing both. He's certainly playing a bunch of warriors, and that's an archetype that we've seen be very successful today. Is black, white decks have been doing quite well on yeah. our feature matches. 
the feed of resistance is definitely the MVP in our feature matches. Yeah, it's been very, very good. Um, one of the most important tricks in the format, and, you know, some warrior triple synergy. So, uh, it appears that Wolfie E. Horrig has uh, drawn his seventh round into uh, what, what he thinks is going to be top eight, and we will just assume it's going to be top eight. Um, and he told me earlier that E today stands for E morphs, because he yep. just played all the morphs. So, congratulations, Wolfie. So, Ian just plays um, a 3 2 and passes a turn, and he's kind of hoping to be able to um, triple block the side of the here yeah. and, and hopefully stabilize. Yeah, he's got. He's really got to get it off the board somehow, because otherwise he's dead. He can't actually triple block it though, because he, he can. He, uh, there's uh, does, point okay, of toughness. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's an extra point of toughness there, so he'll die to any removal spell, any trick in the format. But if not, he goes down to one, and he's still grizzly. Yeah. So he's still, you know, an incredibly bad position for him to be on, and uh, with a follow up here from Jens, which is a hooting mandrel, exiling a card. So. We may be going to game two right here. That's not looking for you. All right, Ian Wood packs it up. Uh, like we saw last round, Jens getting ahead very early and defending that lead. That kind of shows um, how important the fifth mana and the third color is for um, for Ian. Yeah. Like even though he had a free drop, four drop, and was um, dropping a card every turn, he was getting really behind by not having the the third color and like having access to more powerful cards. Yeah. We've seen Jens, uh, you know, he's got very high card quality in his deck, and if you're not keeping up with it, and, you know, if you're missing lands, he's probably going to punish you for that. Um, especially with cards like Alpine Grizzly, which is, you know, clocked in for four every turn in that game. It never got blocked, so uh, it makes short work of someone who can't really respond to what you're doing. We've kind of seen, like, the power of that 4-2 when it's um, unblocked by a morph straight away. Yep. Yeah, the cards are the cards very good. Uh, despite the fact that you know it is awkward in a lot of situations, the the raw board is pretty hard when it's not. The downside of trading with everything is when it doesn't. It's at five turn clock. Yep. All right, um, coming back to us here. Sam Loy, Jason, Jason Chung, and Quad View once again. Uh, we're looking down the line there at the, the tables, Ian Wood on the left, Jens on the right, Simon Hardin on the front right, and against him, Byron Mahalides. And, uh, yeah, so I think both uh, both uh, tables are, you know, shuffling up for their second game. Getting worked on pretty quickly by the look of it. Everyone on the feature table is X1, which is a very important match coming to second to last round. Um, assuming you win this, you should be able to ID into top eight. But that is not a guarantee. Yeah. So we'll just see how that shakes out at the end of the round. Um, I'm assuming that the standings will go up from the uh, the judges here, and people will be able to make choices in their last round about whether they can draw into the top eight or not, uh, and if they can do it safely. Because this is going to be a limited top eight, I'm going to assume that most people will take the safe route. Uh, you often see in constructed tournaments these days, one or two players taking a risk and trying to go XO, so without a loss into the top eight, so they can be on the play. Uh, I think that's going to be unlikely here today. Though. It's less important and limited yeah. than in constructed. Where the play, the play is more important than constructed, whereas in limited, people just want to be able to draft a deck and hopefully get an advantage that way. And yeah. then, yeah. All right. Power Shuffle here from Jens. So, uh, worth mentioning that Ian Wood's been on the national team before as well as so the Pro Tour. Uh, one of the more experienced players hailing from Adelaide, which is, you know, a, a small but growing community of uh, Magic players in Australia. What about his opponent, Jens Light? Jens? Uh, <laughs> uh, I, I think uh, Dan knows him quite well, and he, he knows that, like, you know, he's been one of the players that's been around Canberra for a, a long time, and one of the, basically one of the old crowd, which is Ian is, Ian is as well, actually. So they've, they've both been around for quite a long time and, you know, uh, have played against each other in nationals yeah. and other big events before. So two solid players essentially playing for top eight. Essentially playing for top eight here, yeah. So straight up with the life gain. We see Ian hitting his red on turn one, signaling that he has a Mardu deck. 
Land pass from Jens. All right. Two drops. Secret of the way. Exactly how you want to start off the game. Especially with all three sources of color on turn two. Yeah. This may be being met by a debilitating injury, and that seems the way of it. Alright. That bloodstain Maya once again. Interesting. And just a pass. Interestingly enough, um, Ian does not have any fur to in play. Maybe maybe his hand was just really dependent on the seat of the way. It's possible, yeah. Um, you know, it, it's not... It's not every game that it's going to get removed on turn two. There's only the one spell in the format that does it. And whilst he saw it last game, there's no guarantee that Jens uh, has actually got it in his hand. So I, I think it's fine to keep that, um, even if it is you know, dependent on the Seeker. Interestingly but, uh, enough, he's grabbing a second mountain in his, um, essentially, what we saw, a black, white, splashing red deck. Yeah. So to me, that indicates something like Arrow Storm. Um, which is, a, you know, a powerful card that, even despite the fact that you're playing black and white creatures for the most part, you, uh, you'll want to be casting. It also shows that you just have swamps in hand, which yep. which may be a mistake by some players to, like, um, fetch another colour of mountain where you don't have any um, double mountain hands, but you just get to second mountain because you have a swamps in hand. Yep. So we see the fetch land going to work here with a turn four scavenger. Yeah, I mean it allowed him to, you know, actually ritual into that delve spell there, um, getting it a turn earlier than he would have otherwise, which is, you know, pretty good use of the <laughs> the uh, iconic rare. And just an attack for three from the salt high scavenger, uh, in again taking the uh, aggressive foot, and a Mardu rough rider. We're in for a rough ride. <laughs> we are. <laughs> Uh, so, what's the text on that card? Um, so, so Rough Rider allows Ian to like really be on the on the aggressive. Um, Ian Ian will be able to like push through damage with. Oh, not anymore. <laughs> so, as we've seen from Jens, he's got you know uh, quite a lot of efficient removal in that deck, and uh, is you know pushing that damage in quite effectively. Both ways on similar life totals. Uh, Yen's with a little bit more power on board, but uh, in with, with the evasive beater. Checks the morph just to see what they are again. Yep, nothing more embarrassing than turning the wrong morph face up. Six land drop. Starting to get to the point where it's, uh, you know, he's flooding out a little bit. And a yeah. throttle in turn for a pine walker. So I would assume that he picked the right card there, unless the other ones are more. Yeah, people have a tendency to go for the second morph because the second morph is generally better than the first morph. Yeah. Yeah, the first morph often will uh, trade off for a card, so you you don't have that many incentives to, to play your best one first. And a ghost fire blade from Jens. We've seen a lot of those in a feature match. Yeah, the card's very good and sealed. Um, no matter... If it's in your deck, you're playing it pretty much, right? Because you you you're going to have morphs, and you're going to have morphs in color, and the ghost fire blade's going to be good. Best non non mythic rare in the set. I would say well, I would say so in in definitely in a seal pool <coughs> because it doesn't require you to be in any one color. Um, is you know I've heard some good arguments for Crater's Claws being uh, equally powerful, but that does force you to be in red. Yeah, I can't imagine um, any deck this weekend not running many morphs. Okay, showing that smite the monstrous to gain two life from his eagle of the roost, and trying to kill the morph here. So, 5 damage in the air for Ian Wood, as well as gaining a bit of life. Do you like the play of doing it now, or waiting until he potentially unmorphs it? I like it uh, I like it here, actually. I, I, I think that Jens has enough cards in hand that you wouldn't expect him to invest that mana into uh, unmorphing that card. So, I would rather do it than allow him a draw step to potentially protect it with something. It plays around Psycho Morlet and Misfire Weaver greatly. Yeah. But if it was an abomination, perhaps he might have unmorphed it to try and loot. Yeah, I mean, I, th I think I would. I, it depends. It depends if you want to make the assumption on whether or not you think he's got action in hand or not. And uh, either way, it's it's it's, it's uh, a, a pretty, you know, marginal choice. And I think it really depends on who you're seeing across from more than anything. It appears Jens is out of gas, as we see a murderous cut coming in. Yeah, another piece of removal from his uh, pretty high card quality deck here. So 14 plays 11. 
So if Jin draw like any creature spell, oh, if Jin draws any creature spell, he he would have quite a good board position, and we see him draw a morph right here. So something face down. I think it was a black creature. Um, I wouldn't be surprised to see it as a ruthless ripper, uh, because we've seen it from him today already. Was this the same pool that also had Sagamore? Yep. So it could be anything. It could be. I thought I saw a black card there. So, so yeah. you're saying this morph can be anything in the format? It could be literally anything in the format. <laughs> Big calls here. Hopefully not a forest. Hopefully not a forest, yeah. It might lose in the game. So Absin Falconeer from uh, Ian Wood, which is another one of the Outlast creatures, which grants all the creatures that you control with plus one, plus one counter flying. Uh, it looks like Ian's actually got a fairly uh, large amount of evasive creatures in his deck, which sort of explains why he was trying to get in so aggressively early game in the previous game. So we can see the Ghost Fireblade going, going to work right here, turning all morphs into 4-4. Four, four. For a measly one mana and one mana to clip on any morph, you can yeah. see how this is like a limited powerhouse. Yeah, it's pretty busted, hey? And it's own ancestor as a... Uh, and it's a ripper. Okay, it reveals it as a ripper, drains for two. And his own ancestor hits the battlefield. Do you like shrinking the, the ripper right here just to get in the extra two? It depends. It depends if you, like, when you want to um, play that disowned ancestor. Because he's got a land in hand, there's no guarantee that he'll get that two in at any other stage. Uh, but, you know, it's a, it's definitely a risk. Like, you know, it, it's possible that there's black, black cards on top of his deck to do it. And he's giving up a damage next turn to do it probably anyway, so... It's also giving more information to his opponent. Yeah. But, which is he's... certainly relevant. And Crater's Claw is for lethal by the look of that. <laughs> the other card that's extremely powerful for this so, very reason. So Ghostfire Blade or Crater's Claw? I don't know. It's hard to say. In this game, definitely Crater's Claw. Jens goes to zero life, and uh, yeah, Crater's Claw takes the title for at least this game. All right, just starting to get a better picture of what's in these players' decks. Um, in seems to have a lot of evasive creatures and you know ways to close out the game. We haven't seen an arrow storm yet, but the Crotus Clause is a very good reason to stay aggressive early. Yens is more the famous blue green with another color morph deck, and in this case, the Sultai deck. He has a wide variety of morphs, and obviously, the Ghost Fire Blade that goes with it, and a lot of remo removal spells as we see. Um, what I really like about his deck is he has expensive morphs, and he also has cheap ones like the Ripper. Yep. So, so that kind of like polarizes his morph range more. Yeah, he manages to add some equity to his side of the board that way. There's um, no guarantee that every morph that he has is going to be something like a more one, but you know, there's one of them in there, and there's also a Ruthless Ripper in there, so you need to make... You know, you're forced into making fairly rough decisions based on the fact that he could have anything in those colors. We see Yen's now um, sideboarding out a wall, and he's considering sideboarding out a de Death Frenzy. What do you think about this? Um, he might have sideboarded that Death Frenzy in under the assumption that Ian was slightly more aggressive than he is. Uh, I don't know, that card is very up and down in value. It looks like he's taking the Archer's Parapet out though, and leaving it in. Um, I would probably leave the Death Frenzy in. I'm, I'm very happy to cast that card in most games. Despite seeing a lot of 2-3 from um, Ian's deck, um, Death Frenzy is really good in the format where there's lots of morphs. Yep. But at the same time, it would hit Ian's creatures. Yeah, I think it benefits Jens as well because he has the higher card quality in this matchup. That, uh, you know, if he has something to bail him out against an aggressive start against, um, from Ian, um, that'll sort of, you know, allow, allow him to turn a bad position into a winnable one. Given Ian is on the play in the last game, how do, how do you like his chances? I think he's pretty good here. Like, uh, there's a number of cards that he could have in his opening hand that are uh, all combinations of cards, which will be very hard for Ian to keep up with. Um, especially because we've seen proactive threats like Alpine Grizzly and the Savage Punch, as well as the Ghost Fireblade. Uh, so, I mean, I, for my money, I like Jens in this because he's on the play. But, uh, you know, this is definitely a game here. Being a morph deck, he definitely wants to um, play his 2 2 before Ian does. Yeah, for sure. Increases the value of that, that Ghost Fireblade as well because you can just. Uh, you're attacking into, you know, a 2 2 when you've got a 4 4 rather than attacking into two two twos and and that sort of stuff which would allow Ian more options in that position. 
We can see Yin's going back into the sideboard, reconsidering. Yeah, so it looks like he's taken out his thousand wins in this matchup. He doesn't think he'll have the time to turn it off. What no do you doubt. What do you think about taking out Thousand Wins? You don't have to morph that card. Yeah, look, to be honest, I would be leaving it in personally. That card, you know, the roof on that card's so high. Like, it, it does win the game when you flip it up pretty much. So, I don't think there's any situation where I'd be taking it out, but there's, cer there's certainly a logic to it as well. Um, I think his reasoning might be because he's a black-green splash blue deck. And he can't pay for it? Yeah, he, yeah. If, if you paid attention, he actually only had one blue source last game, I believe. And, yeah. and his main black and green. We haven't seen we haven't seen more than one island on the inside. So yeah, so you think he's taking it out for the purposes of consistency? Yep. Um, I think that's the reason he's taking it out. I don't know if I agree with it because you can always morph it if you don't have double blue. Yep. Yeah, it, it depends on how many blue sources are in the deck. Um, but I, I think I would just leave it in for those long games because it does completely break the game open uh, if it happens to stall out. But then again, that might not be a problem in this matchup for Jens. That card is kind of like a charm. It has three modes. You can play as a 2-2 two, two for free. You can play as a 5-6 five, five for 6. Or you can blow someone out for 7. Yeah. All of which are extremely good. Alright. Going to game 3. Jens on the play. Seems to have a Savage Punch and Alpine Grizzly combo in his hand. Yeah. And it's an easy kick for him. We can see Yens always has a black and green green hand, um, dictating the blue splash. Yep. Alright, fetch from Ian. Knows exactly what he's getting in this game. Fetching here would indicate to me that his hand might be a little bit mana heavy. He wants to wants to thin it a little bit rather than waiting to his turn. Uh, marginal change on the percentage chance of drawing a land during his next turn. He might not want to draw like his only mountain left in his deck. It's possible, yeah. Man with many choices. All right. He decides to play a tap plan and gain one life. Going back to twenty, and Yen's presumably uh, salt I colored into the Alpine Grizzly that he has. A formula which has no doubt been working well for him all day today. Will we see a repeat of game one? Does Ian have an answer? He's playing the uh, Mardu Warchief here? No, Falconer. He has a Mardu Warchief in his hand, so I was uh, <laughs> almost expecting him to play it exactly the same way. We can see a Savage Punch in Yen's hand, and that would that would make Ian take six. Yeah, take out the Falconer and take six. Again, just a, a really good tempo play and a way to get your clock started really aggressively. We've seen this combo time and time again in the sealed format. Yeah, that's very good. There's a Smite the Monstrous in uh, Ian's hand. It'll be interesting to see whether he deploys this threat or uses that to get the Alpine Grizzly off the board. Um, given how Game 1 played out, it, it might be the way he wants to go with it. Yeah. No more taking 20 damage from one creature. Interestingly enough, he trades 4 mana for 3. Yeah. And might be setting up Yens for the Saltai um, Scavenger. Yeah, so he, he does have a Saltai Scavenger in hand, so Yens is probably quite happy with this turn of events. Uh, Ian may be trying to run him out of threats. Like it, It's a legitimate option given what happened in the previous game, that uh, Yens' deck, despite the fact that it has a lot of removal and a lot of interaction, that sort of thing, uh, it's not as threat-heavy as some hands can be. An Amadu Rough Rider from Ian Wood, a high quality card than the Saltai Scavenger, yet it can't block it. Despite being in Mardu Colors, Ian's deck is quite slow and controlly with like a large amount of removal. Yeah, so I, I assume that when he was building this deck, he just went for where the card quality was, and it happened to be, you know, in Mardu Colors, which is normally aggressive, but the fact that he's just playing a bunch of good cards is, uh, you know, a mid rangey sort of thing to do. I believe we see two of the same morphs here. Both, which is the Saltai Looter. Sure, um, Abomination of uh, something. <laughs> abomination of Ghoul. 3-4 when, when it deals combat damage to a player, draw a card, discard a card. Okay, so Mardu Rough Rider attacks and forces one of the morphs not to block. Uh, 
and we see a follow up in a Mardu Horde Chief. So coming into play with the Raid Trigger, allowing him to get a Soldier onto the battlefield and a Skull Hunter again with the Raid Trigger, forcing him to uh, forcing Yens to discard his last land. So we're just gonna see a token here in a little bit. Despite having no cards in hand and very um, small creatures, Yens actually has um, quite a quite a lot in the morphs. Yeah, the fact that the morphs are actually both, uh, if they are both abominations, right, that they are of a high quality card, um, really does make a difference here. And if he starts looting every turn, it means that he's not really going to be drawing that many blanks for the rest of the game. If one was a side mauler here, it would be pretty big. Yeah. Again, he can just represent that as well, and it makes blocking a very hard choice for Ian. Ian has seen the Sagan Mauler, so it's probably on his mind. I think it, at this point, it's not a card that he can realistically beat. So, uh, his, his play is somewhat forced, despite the fact that he might have it, he can't really make that many choices. He might be thinking the one behind could be a Sagan Mauler, because the Rough Rider can target it, and then you flip over. It is a Sagan Mauler, as it turns out. So he's going to get over for 5 with the Saga Mauler and an additional 3 with the Bird Warrior. And, uh, you know, a total of 8, dropping in with the 3. That's a total of 9, right? Uh, so it was a, there was one point of block damage from the token. Ah, right. So this isn't looking great for Ian. As uh, Jens can probably see the top 8 from here. This, mo this moment for Yens must be pretty nerve-wracking. Nerve yeah. Like, you're like so close, but you don't have it locked up yet. Yeah, I mean, it's possible he's playing all manner of things, including end hostilities, and... Ah, uh, he just gets the concession. No way to stop the flyer. Interesting he didn't at least play it out to represent, considering it's for top 8. Yeah, I mean, I would have played it out, but at the same time, his, uh, his options are limited to passing the turn and waiting until Yens attacks him. So. Maybe his out is the more... The morph has not been flipped. Ah, maybe that's more. The, I, I just point to no. It's an abomination, and Jens doesn't game loss himself. So, congratulations, Jens. Uh, we presume you're making top eight from this, and uh, very well played. And he really hasn't been allowing any of his opponents any breathing room. We're going to table two now. So, is this the first time? Uh, this is the first time we've been on table two. So we see uh, Byron Mahalides versus Simon Hardin here. I believe those names are actually on the wrong side of the screen, but uh, yeah, both players with a bunch of lands which would have come to play tapped and not much action apart from a disdainful stroke which traded with the Summit Prowler by the look of it. A torment in voice for Byron. How do you like that card, torment in voice? You know what, it's the second time we've seen that card. Wild Guess was the first version, it was red red instead of red one. I like the fact that they're trying to push it to make it playable. Um, I don't think it's quite good enough yet though. I I think they're trying to um, give you more spells for Jeskai, sure because of prowess. Yep. And they're trying to, they're trying to find more spells that you would actually want in your deck, and you don't have to lower your creature count that much. Sure. Yeah. I mean the card's very powerful in that archetype, and uh, definitely uh, definitely seen a bunch of it in people's seal pools today, uh, despite the fact that we haven't seen much of it on the feature match area. We see more from Simon with his unsleeving the morph technique. Yeah, so this is the thing that some players are doing. Because you game loss yourself, if you don't reveal all your morphs, forcing yourself to put it back in the sleeve forces you to check with, uh, check that you're doing that and, uh, you know, not putting yourself in a position to harm your chances at winning the tournament. How do you approach your morphs? Um, I actually haven't been doing this, but I think I'm going to start. I hadn't thought of it that much, to be honest, because I'm, I haven't really been playing any competitive REL events, and, you know, I've just been happy to turn my card over. But, you know, it's a really big uh, big risk not, um, you know, not, not doing something to force yourself to, to flip your cards up. Exactly. Um, we, we see this um, four-color deck run out a raid creature and presumably another. So, oh. Mighty War Shrieker, when it enters, if raid was triggered, it adds a red, a white, and a black to your mana pool. So, Byron is, uh, has three mana in pool right now, and we'll see what the uh, additional play is. Mighty War Shrieker, really just a fantastic tempo play. And it looks like he's crazy clawing the uh, face down card for two. Interesting use of that card. Uh, in general, if I had any other option, I'd do that. Um, Crazy Claws is such a high value card that I'd like to, you know, wait as long as possible. And it gets a Glacial Stalker, sure, but that was a game winning card that 
may have just gone and been spewed off too easily there. Do you think it kind of gives away the rest of Byron's hand? That he has no action apart from that? or he, Either he has no action or he has the game very locked up. Yeah, look, uh, given that it's Byron, I wouldn't assume anything other than the fact that he's just bad. But uh, Byron's one of the newer players in the in the in Melbourne, and uh, you know he's been he's been doing okay. Like he's he's turning up to events, and he's a very enthusiastic dude. But like at the same time, I wouldn't assume that he's making the correct choice. He is one game away from the top, from potentially the Pretty top. Sure top we should, I should be giving him a little bit more credit. You're right. We see a crippling chill from Simon. This crippling chill might meet a feat of resistance, but Byron is currently considering it. I think that would be a very good play. So feat of resistance gives this creature protection on blue, not not allowing the crippling chill to tap the creature, and also not allowing Simon to draw a card. This also gives the creature plus one plus one, yep. making it a four four, which might be relevant for ferocious. I think Simon's having a think about whether he for casts force away on it in response, um, which will save him three life and. <laughs> okay, apparently he uh, also has another crippling chill, so he only draws one card here. I think that's a better play, actually, than uh, using the force away here. So Simon managed to keep, in, to keep most of the uh, damage up him at, the, at this stage of the game. He's obviously behind on board, but uh, you know, giving himself the maximum chance to get back into this game. <laughs> So, I'm not sure what card that gold card is in Simon's hand. I think that's a June Blast. It's a June Blast. Uh, no wonder he's in so many colours. That thing's really good. <laughs> we don't actually see a black mana on Simon's side. Yeah, what? so he's still a little way off casting it. Is hey. Simon still on 23, or presumably he's on less than 23 because he took two last turn? Yeah. Uh, just Can we get the updated life totals, please? We see a Valley Dasher and a Bastion for four from Byron. Simon's considering his options and he takes four. Alright, I think Simon's just on the uh, Doom Blast G plan right now. So burning away the Mardu War Shrieker. So, five cost spell, uh, which does six damage and exiles all cards from Player's Graveyard. I think what Simon's considering is that he doesn't have any untapped black sources, and if he does draw a black source, it's probably a come into play tap land. Oh, sure. That's a good point. So even if he could cast Doom Blast, the sooner he casts it, it's a turn after this. It'd be interesting to see if he trades his Barrage of Boulders for the uh, Warname Aspirant, Sprint, but he I chooses not to there. Um, presumably he knows something we don't, or is trying to extract a little bit more value here. He falls to 11 here and draws a Woolly Fotter. Woolly, woolly locks it on. Woolly locks it on. So it's a morph creature that turns up for 6. It's a 7 cost 6-7. Six, so tapping, I believe, the full 7 mana, which is hard casting it. So no doubt he's getting crippling chilled. Did we see a fist bump from Byron there? He, he made some motion before he crumbling chill. This might represent <laughs> lethal. Yeah, he, he tends to wear his emotions uh, on his sleeve there. So, Leaping Master is a follow up. This barrage of boulders is now two for one. Maybe that'll uh, convince Simon to uh, cash in finally. His patience is um, getting rewarded. Yeah, absolutely. Interestingly enough, um, Byron has a treasure cruise in hand, which now he can cast, but the burn away prevented the treasure cruise for quite a few turns. That extra text actually did something, which is kind of cool. Um, the Valley Dasher, of course, is going to come in for another two here, but Simon, uh, Simon's not under quite as much pressure as he was uh, a minute ago. So, more face down. And attack for two. A free weapon master to turn it up to get into that extra damage and a force away. Punishing him somewhat for getting uh, a little greedy there. I really like that play because he can't play the Valley Dasher here, although it does have haste. 
and it also he prevents uh, five damage, allows him to untap with his uh, his blocker, and he's drawn a monastery um, monastery flock. So he's actually in a position where he's started to stabilize the board, and that uh, doom blast might come into play if the game keeps going for a little bit longer. An attack by Simon, not what I was expecting. I do like this play. Um, yeah. The, fel the Valley Dasher will pressure Simon, but Simon's on a four-turn clock through the Valley Dasher, and that's the same number of clock that Lossodon is on. Sure. So he's actually, you know, in a position where he can actually race here. Of course, that discounts uh, the fact that Byron can interact with him after that treasure cruise. I don't like his attack anymore. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it suddenly looks a lot worse. A free weapon master getting in for four. Interestingly enough, doesn't play the Valley Dasher again. Summit Prowler. All right, two lethal creatures, and it looks like no black source for no Simon. No black source for Simon, so he might have gotten a little too greedy. He's double checking his lands. Do they have a black source this whole time? <laughs> okay. And Byron gets there. So, uh, congratulations uh, to Byron. It looks like he's uh, made top eight now. A uh, An expert at the magical games, it appears. It kind of showed the downside of running so many colors as we can see the Doom Blast. This might be a really powerful card stuck in Simon's hand for so long. Yeah. It's a very high reward card, but, uh, you know, sometimes you get punished on it. And we're seeing the emotion on the face. Of Byron Mahalides. I think by now Byron realizes that he's probably a lock in for the top eight. Welcome back to the booth, Samuel Loy, Jason Chung. Uh, yeah, it was a, a couple of interesting games we saw there. Um, I, I think that, yeah, you know what? Simon really did get punished for taking the line that he took. Uh, he obviously didn't have a great hand there, and he probably wasn't winning a long game, but you know, if he'd stayed in it for a couple more turns, it's possible that he would have been able to leverage that Doom Blast into a winning position. Uh, hard to say at this point, of course, because he didn't get there. Yeah, he took he took a line of play that involved him attacking, and the, with the amount of cards his opponent was drawing, he kind of had to put pressure, or eventually he would be swarmed. Yeah. Anyway, uh, that's us for this round. That's round seven of the PDQ for Fate Reforged in Melbourne, presented by Good Games and Sneak and Show. Uh, we'll see you next round.